Father's Day, everybody. Well, all your fathers, anyway. You know, <clears throat> uh, about 30 years ago, I wrote a song called Legacy of Love, and um, Dina suggested maybe that we should do it today, and I thought, yeah, that might fit in okay for the Father's Day thing. Um, it talks about um, my grandpa, uh, my grandma, and my, uh, my parents, and, and my kids, and how that... Um, I want, to, I want to leave a legacy, a legacy of uh, for fathers out there, for everyone. And I got to thinking about some people don't, didn't really have a father or maybe were a disconnected father. Um, if you did, you have a heavenly father who loves you and is always there for you. And you can still leave that legacy. Even if you don't have any kids, you can leave a legacy with those around you. So this is Legacy of Love. Time to give 
is what our children gain. The greatest gift to leave behind comes from up above. Pass it on the legacy of love. gave precious things we could call our own vacations in the summer sun in a house that was a home it taught us how to love the Lord and live unselfish I'm thankful for the blessings given me and riches fade away the memories remain what we take in time to give is what our children gain the greatest gift to leave from up above pass it on the legacy of love my own smile at me I know I must continue on the legacy to leave behind comes from up above pass it on the legacy of love Just want to say uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, and uh, we appreciate you and we're thankful for you. But I also want to say thank you to any um, man who has ever stepped into a role, maybe not a father, as an uncle, as a family member, or even just somebody in the church that you've stepped in and you've uh, helped those who are younger to mentor and to teach. Um, it is very important. And I want to thank those who've done that as well this morning. As uh, we look to the week ahead and the things coming up here, um, we do have Vacation Bible School coming uh, July 22nd and 23rd. Um, that is a Thursday and Friday. Um, it starts at 5 p.m. and will end at 8 p.m. Who wants to volunteer? We have the positions that we need open so that you can kind of see what you would like to do and what's open for you. And so um, please check that out there in the foyer. We also have little fishes hanging on one of the posts out there. Those are items that we need maybe uh, for borrowed or you could share with us for VBS. And so take a look at that. If you have something at home that you can bring in, we'd appreciate that. It gives us uh, the ability to decorate, gives us the ability to do some of the things without having um, if you can help, we would love to have you help with our Vacation Bible School this year. Remember, Monday nights is Celebrate Recovery here. We have a meal at 515. After the meal uh, at 6, we come up here for worship and a Bible lesson. After the worship and Bible lesson, we split into small groups. Um, and men go to one section of the church. Women go to the other section of the church. And basically, you discuss the things that you're dealing with. And it's for anybody with any habits, hurts, or hang-ups. And so it's not just for people who might be also for anyone just dealing with struggles of life and you just can't seem to overcome it. So please, if you are dealing with something in your life and you need some help, please come to Celebrate Recovery. And even maybe if you're not, um, come and see what it's all about. Maybe you can be a part and help as well uh, with those uh, that are struggling and to just be a mentor or be someone in their life. And so we'd love to have you there. Remember that we do have coffee out in the foyer. Uh, make sure you stop by, grab a cup of coffee. We'd love to offer that to you. And so 
please take advantage of that. Also, remember, we do have children's uh, church downstairs for service, and we have nursery available as well. And so um, we're glad to have those ministries back and going and, and doing well. Finally, um, remember that on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock, we have our um, prayer meeting that meets here at the church. Um, we come in and we pray together. And you have any questions? Martha Dane would definitely uh, field any questions for you. Uh, but we'd love to have you be a part of that prayer meeting. And then finally, I thought that was final, but this is final, I promise. Uh, I guess some of the envelopes handed out this morning uh, for the guys may not have a card in it. So check it beforehand. <laughs> And we'll make sure you get one with a card in it because we want to make sure you uh, are appreciated today for you. Uh, if you'll stand, not only is it Father's Day is a day to remember uh, the men who have made an impact in our lives and be thankful for them. It's also a day to remember our Heavenly Father who loves us, who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came so that he could make a way so that we can have access to the Father. And so this morning, let us praise our Heavenly Father as we sing.
yet in love he sought me and on his shoulder gently lay and home rejoicing brought me in death's dark veil i fear no ill with thee dear lord beside me thy rod and staff my comfort still thy cross before to guide me never failing ruler of my heart everlasting lover of my soul on the mountain high or in the valley low the king of love my shepherd is the king of love my shepherd is Undeniable I I can hardly 
speak peace of unexplainable light I can hardly think as you call deeper still as you call deeper still as you call me deeper still in love you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I What a beautiful song, just talking about our Heavenly Father and how He loves us and how He's good and He wants good things for us. And we know sometimes in life it seems hard and it, sometimes in life we may not feel that love from God, but that love is always there for us. And so this morning, if you're struggling with something, if you're dealing with something, you just want to spend time with that good, good Father. You want to know what's in your heart or what's going on. This morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer, the altars are open. And if you feel led, won't you come? Please stand as we sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of life. We thank you for all of the good and great things that you have given us. You are truly a good, good Father, and we love you, and we thank you. We thank you. You are willing to give up your life so that we might find freedom in sin. And Lord, we just thank you that you have freed us from sin. And Lord, we thank you that when you rose from the dead, not only did you give us the promise of eternal life, but you also raised us from the deadness of our sins. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for continually being there for us. 
strengthening us and enabling us, dear Lord. And I thank you for those who've come today, those who are watching on Facebook today. I thank you for them. Lord, I pray whatever they may be dealing with today, whatever they may be lifting up to you today, Lord, whatever it may be, that you would hear their cry and you would show them your mercy today and that they might know the peace that passes. Lord, as we move to the message, I pray today that you would move me out of the way. Lord, that I might not speak my own words, but Lord, you would echo your voice through me so that the people might hear what you have for them and Lord they might be transformed and changed by it we thank you Lord for all that you do and we pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son Well, good morning again. Um, <clears throat> this morning, I, I have a video clip, but I want to set it up a little bit. I don't know if you remember the days of riding along in a, in a bus and getting hot in there and you want to put down the window, but the person behind you doesn't want that window down and the struggle that you have. Well, I want to share a clip this morning of such, uh, of such struggle. And so if you could just go ahead and uh, play that for me, Cheney. Now, I spared you. That went on for four minutes. <laughs> Can you imagine four minutes of a ride fighting over a window and uh, just closing and opening it? But I think of it kind of in the way of us and God, how God wants to open the window of blessings, but we want to do it our way. We want it our way and how we struggle and fight with God's will in our lives and how that really is a and what really is at the heart of most of our sins and most of our struggles in life. 
and that's pride. That we become so prideful that we become, that we need to do it on ourselves with our own initiative and our own ways. And God's saying, no, I know a better way. I know you. I created you. I made you. And I have blessings for you. But instead, we want to try to close that window because we think we know. And that's what we're coming here uh, in this story this morning from our Old Testament, our, our walk through the Sunday School Old Testament uh, lessons, and uh, really an interesting story that just God just unfolded, and I want to share with you today uh, the story of Babel. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, the Tower of Babel, please turn to Genesis chapter 11 this morning. Genesis chapter 11 uh, to go there. That is a beautiful sound, the turn of pages. <laughs> you can't hear that, but it's good that you have your phone too. If you have your phone or your tablet, that's good too. I just can't hear it, uh, but I'm glad you're uh, getting there as well. Genesis is at the front of the Bible for those who might be struggling. That's <laughs> lazy, smarty pants. That's great. All right, we're reading from uh, Genesis chapter 11 this morning. And it says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and, mor <coughs> and tar for mortar. They, uh, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, uh, from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. It's very interesting when we come to this story because there are many uh, ancient civilizations that we have records and, and other biblical sources out there that talk about how the world became different languages and came scattered throughout the world. And uh, it's very interesting when we come to this one um, because often they, the other uh, stories that are out there, the other things that are out there that try to explain what happened, often see it as a positive thing that these people scattered through the earth and were able to talk. However, is a different, has a different take on it because the Bible is trying to share to us that this was not something of positive, but that in fact it was a punitive thing. That God turns them away from each other because he sees something going on here. Something deeper. Something that's the problem and struggle with sin. This story is, is really interesting because it's wedged between... Uh, often we forget that. We often, when we come to the uh, stories in the Bible, we think they're separate and they're individual. But we realize that the Bible is the whole story of God's redemptive plan for the world. And so there are two very important things that we see. The first thing was Noah, what we talked about last week. At that point, Noah they said that man was so sinful that everything was so evil that God had to wipe the earth. The next story after this, and, and what we'll be talking about next week, is Abraham. The story of how God calls a man out to be a nation, to, to, to be the father of a nation who is going to follow God and is going to share the redemptive message of God until Jesus comes. And wedged in between is the story of the descendants of Noah 
And what's going on here? Sin's effect again. Here we have this nation that is now becoming to be a part where they are not facing or, or realizing God and not listening to God's will, but they are out to make their own mark on the world. They want to do it their way. You know, I did it my way. You know, that's what they wanted to do. Problem of sin. And we probably, the problem of, that the city of Babel has, it's the sin of pride. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that, they, uh, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. The story is about the fact that God does scatter people and, and that we do see why there are different languages and there are different nations and different countries from that. But we realize the reason that God did it was because at that time and that place, the people were not listening, not following God's will, but they were doing their own thing. And God realized he had to deal once again with the problem of sin in that day and the sin of pride. It's very interesting. It says there, there is a fear and a uh, and pride comes out of a fear and a desire. The fear was that they were going to be scattered all over the earth. If we don't come together, we don't build this city, we don't make this tower, we don't do this thing for our name, they're gonna, we're going to be scattered and we're going to be separated and we're going to be away from each other. There was a fear that they had and they thought by building this city they would alleviate that fear. And the second part, think about that today. We all, in some way, at some point in our lives, want to make a name for ourselves. It is a natural desire to follow God that has been twisted to make ourselves God of our lives. And rather than what we were made to do to make a name for God and give God the glory, we in turn, now want to make a name for ourselves. They did not seek God in their fears, and they did not check their desires with God. The city of Babel did not deal with those fears in their lives, and they did not check the desires of their heart with God. It's very interesting um, and I, I didn't catch this until I went through and started researching this and, and looking at this, because sometimes we don't catch some of the context and the cultural ideas that are going on in here. Do you know that moving eastward has a connotation of moving from God's blessing in, in the Bible? In Genesis uh, 3, 23 and 24, it said, So the Lord God banished him, talking about Adam, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed him on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Remember the story of Lot. Genesis chapter 13, 10 and 12. Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, and while Lot lived among the city of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. And there's a other references of this too, whenever somebody seems to be moving eastward, it seems to have a connotation that they're moving away from the blessings of God. And we see Sodom, we, uh, we see the Tower of Babel, the people of Battle, uh, Babel being moving eastward, moving away from God's blessing because they're not following God's will. They are not following their man, what man was created to, to give God glory but in fact, they're going after their own ways, their own desires. 
And folks, let me tell you, pride is an easy snare to fall into. And we must be careful. All right, it's, it's Father's Day. So here we go. A couple dad jokes for you today. Why can't giraffes say they're sorry? Because their necks are so long they can't swallow their pride. Okay. What do you call a prideful uh, dinosaur? An egosaurus. Okay. All right. We can laugh at that, but, but, but in all honesty, pride is not a joke. Pride comes from our inabilities, listen to this, to deal with the insecurities of life. Our pride comes from our inability to deal with the insecurities of our life. Rather than find our significance in God, where God wants us to find our significance, because God made you beautiful. He made you unique. He made you in his image, and he has such high value of you that he was willing to send his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for us. But the problem is we don't always want to find the significance in him or we struggle to find our significance in him and we try to find our significance in other things. And when we do that, we will never be filled. It doesn't matter what position you have in life. It doesn't matter what relationship you have in life. It doesn't matter the things that you can buy and get in life. It doesn't mean all of the acclimates that you may get because you know what? In the end, they'll all go away when we die. The only thing that we can find our significance in and will find our significance is is in Christ. And if we continue to seek these things and these insecurities in our lives, we become prideful, we become boastful. And what happens when we become prideful, boastful, and we're, we're doing those things? We begin to get crazy. We don't want anybody else to get it, right? You know, because they're, we're getting it. And then we get jealous, and then we get angry, and then we get all of these other things that all stem from that pride in our hearts and our lives. Psalms 27 says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's talking about the kings and nations of that day. Some of them trusted in all these other things in life that they thought would keep them secure, would think they'd keep their nations great, but God has taken down many a nations that were prideful. And it's the same thing in our lives. Our our insecurities will only abound when we try to secure them. Because if our security isn't coming from Christ, we will never feel secure. Pride comes from our desire of self-reliance. That's a part of the fall, folks. That's the whole story. Eve was tempted in the garden with what? the knowledge of God, to be like God. And it worked. And Adam ate as well. And that's the thing, folks. You know, we want to be the God of our lives, right? We want to tell everybody and tell ourselves that we are the God of our lives and we will make these decisions and we'll do these things and this is how we're going to live our life. And then it all seems to come falling apart because every time we make a plan, it seems somehow it comes unraveled. And pride also comes from the desire to be noticed the desire to have accolades. Folks, I want to make a a little caveat here. I want to say two things. There is a difference between being proud proud in something and being prideful. It's okay every once in a while to say, wow, I'm proud I did this, or take pride in your work, or take pride in the things that you're doing, or even your family. The problem becomes is when it becomes boastful and it becomes the source of your happiness and your joy because it will never give you full happiness and joy. 
it's great to say, I did this. And to look at that and say, wow, that was, that was something good. But then say, thank you, Father. Thank you for helping me do that. Thank you, Father, for me, having me have this experience, to have this ability to do these things. Because I know in all things that are good, they come from you because you're the good Father. It's kind of like this. Let me give you another example. Looking around here. I need a father who likes lollipops. Is there a father who really loves lollipops? Nick, you really love lollipops? Come on up here, Nick. Come on up here, Nick. I got something for you for Father's Day. I got a special treat for you. Now, do you like orange? Uh, you would like cherry, wouldn't you? But you do like lollipops, right? Okay. And what, what do you like about lollipops? They last a while. They last a while. You get that flavor, and it's really good tasting. And So would you like a lollipop today? Sure. You sure you want a lollipop today? It's a cherry. It's not cherry. It's orange. <laughs> well, I got a Father's Day lollipop for you. Here you go. I've eaten a cricket, by the way. You've eaten a... Oh, he's already had this. He knows what's going on. Can you put the picture up, Chaney? This is the lollipop I gave him. There is a dead cricket in the middle of his lollipop. <laughs> it's Father's Day. You got to do a Father's Day type joke. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's what, that's, what, that's what this self-reliance and this self-desire is like. It may seem sweet at first, but the more and more we get to it, there's a dead cricket inside. Because... In the end, all of these works are for nothing. They're futile without God in them. Thank you. You can take that if you want. Sure. Okay? <laughs> Tell me how that cricket tastes, okay? <laughs> I can't get anybody to work with me here. Come on. <laughs> I wish I could have somebody on Facebook. Maybe one of you would have uh, reacted a little bit more uh, crazy with that. But thank you. Thank you, Nick. And here's the thing. God punishes the prideful. He fools their plans. Because no matter how well you think you've got your life planned out, if it ain't with God, it's going to fail. And we're going to deal with it. Listen to what Proverbs 16, 18, uh, 16, 18 says. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. You know that old proverb? You know, pride goes before destruction. Oh, how mighty the, the how, how far the fallen, the mighty, I can't even say it now. All right, let's just go on. But you get the point. I had it in my brain. Uh, Genesis 6, uh, 6 and 8, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now, catch the tongue-in-cheek here. You may not catch this. Remember, they said, let, re remember earlier, they said, let, come, let us go make a, a city, make a, a tower. Now, listen to what God says. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them uh, from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the, st the city. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. God says, okay, you want to make this plan? You think you're going to get your own security? You think you're going to do all of this? I'm going to come down, and I'm going to do the very thing that you were afraid of because you weren't putting your trust and your will in me. You weren't looking for me to be the source of your blessing. You were looking to yourself. What a different story it would have been if they had not moved, but they had stayed secure in God's will. Might have had a different story and a different outcome than this one. The thing they feared the most was what they got in the end. Think about that. The prideful will be humbled. This is from Mary's song about Jesus. Uh, when she found out that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. Luke one fifty two says, He, being God, has brought down the rulers and their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. So 
So what is the best medicine? What is the best thing that we can do to avoid pride in our lives? It's very simple, but not easy to do. Humility is the best medicine for pride. How do we be humble? How do we share humility? How do we do humility in our lives? First thing is to give God the glory. Give God the glory daily. Everything that happens in our lives that are good, realize it comes from the Father and give Him glory for it. Listen to uh, what it says here in um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving, uh, your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. One of the ways that we can give God glory and, do, and, and to be humble is to do things when nobody's looking for God. Do it in secret because He sees it and He is the one that we should be honoring and that we should be seeking our significance in, not ourselves. But when we do things that are out there and things that happen and we're in front of people, we can listen to what Paul says. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do things in secret when we can so that God is given the glory for it. And then when we can't do it in secret, doing it in the name of the Father and giving him glory for it. The second thing that we can do to help us have humility is working towards God's will for our lives versus our own. Investing our ambition, our time, our resources, everything towards God's will and God's kingdom. Listen to what one of the smartest men in the whole world, other than Jesus who walked this earth, one of the smartest men of the, uh, in the whole world said, in Ecclesiastes 1.14, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. King Solomon wanted to find the pursuit of happiness. He wanted to know what really is, is a good life. What is the meaning of life? And he looked at it in work. He looked at it in accolades. He looked at it in wealth. He looked at it in all different areas. And everything that he saw was just chasing after the wind. None of it gave meaning. None of it gave purpose. None of it. They all were dead ends in life. But listen to what he says later on in Ecclesiastes 12. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including everything hidden, everything is, whether it is good or evil. The meaning of life that he eventually found was the fact that to fear God and to reverence God, and when you live for him, that is the real meaning of life. And finally, this morning, as we're investing in God's kingdom and God's will, we invest in others and build them up. You want to put all that ambition and all that thing into something that pays dividends, God's kingdom, and then loving other people. John 13 34, a new command I give, to you, I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. When we love others and we build others up, no longer do we have to worry about whether we've got this title or we've got this position or we've got this acclimate and to try to grab, grab everything in life because we continue to try to grab, grab, grab and it's fleeting and it's not there. But when we build up others, we take away from that desire and that need to, for self and we realize really what Jesus came for was to give God the Father glory 
by going to the cross for us and giving up his life. And we can find that meaning in our lives as well. And we can avoid pride when we do this in the name of the Lord. We have to do it in the name of the Lord. But investing our time and our resources in those things, not just in God's kingdom, but in other people. I'm going to close with this this morning. I don't know if you know David Robinson. Some of you who are basketball fans may remember that name, David Robinson. Uh, He played for the San Antonio Spurs. And um, during the 1998-1999 season, um, he was playing on the team, and there was a rising star that was coming up, Tim Duncan. And David Robinson was the man on that team, and he, for the longest time, he was the guy. I mean, he was the MVP. He was the man. And then all of a sudden, here comes this rising star that begins to shine brighter than him. And this is what, I want to read exactly what he said in Sports Illustrated about this incident, about this time in his life. He says, I can't overstate how important my faith has been to me as an athlete and as a person. It's helped me deal with so many things, including matters of ego and pride. For instance, I can't deny that it felt weird to see Tim standing at the podium with the finals MVP trophy. I was thinking, man, never have I come to the end of a tournament and not been holding up that trophy. It was hard. But I thought about the Bible story of David and Goliath. David helped King Saul win a battle, but the king wasn't happy because he had killed thousands of men while David had killed ten thousands of men. So King Saul couldn't enjoy the victory because he was thinking about David's getting more credit than he was. I'm blessed that God has given me the ability to just enjoy the victory. So Tim killed ten thousands, tens of thousands. That's great. I'm happy for him. Do we have a faith that says, I can be happy not being in the spotlight, but glorifying my Father and helping those that are near around achieve greatness along with myself. Pride is easy to fall into and we must guard our hearts and we do that through being humble in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for everything that you have done for us. Lord, I pray as we go out of this place today that you would just watch over us, keep us safe. Lord, I pray that you would just bless each one. And Lord, bring them back next week so we can praise you once again. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.